the stuff we're going to talk about today, some of it came out of a process that the Bible College, which I'm part of, uh, the Irish Bible Institute, IBI, as I'll refer to it as, went through. So I want to begin a little bit by telling you a little bit of that story to just put things in context. Uh, the college itself was formed in 2000 with the kind of coming together of two other smaller institutions. And in about 2005, we need, moved into a new premises, a home finally. We've been living in church premises, packing up every weekend, all of those things. We had a unanimous decision to move into this property deal with a Christian businessman and some of his partners in uh, a, bu a building that was bought. And the way things worked out, uh, we were going to use 40% of it, the other 40% we would rent out, and that would, or the other 80 or 60% we would rent out, and that would cover the cost. So hopefully the process would be, wouldn't cost us anything for the first 15 years. Uh, then in October 2011, it appeared like everything fell apart. We had known for a number of years that there was problems with the property deal because the recession in Ireland had hit and property was now on average worth between 25 and 35 percent of it had been worth. And we had the possibility of uh, financial obligations or liabilities to about 4 million euro down the road. And we were trying to figure out how we would work those out. That was just not going to be possible going forward. Our validation, our accrediting partner, the University of Wales, had simply, the beginning of October, had just dropped um, out of validation globally, walked away from about 235 institutions around the world, of which we were one of them, having to find a new validation partner. Problem with that was, at this moment in time, we weren't particularly financially viable, so that was going to cause us all kinds of difficulties. Uh, part of the problem with the premises was the 60% that we were renting were now vacant and there was no money coming in. And on top of that, the revenue commissioners in Ireland, which would be equivalent to the tax man, because of the property deal, they decided we owed them 150,000 euro. Uh, so life was fairly bleak in October 2011. Uh, we were beginning to think as a staff team as to whether it was time to dust off our CVs or our resumes and begin to look for another job, wondering what's going to happen here. In the midst of that, there were many questions about how does God lead? Partly because uh, the decision that we made and believed to be right back in 2005, by the time it got to 2010, objectively one could say it was obviously wrong. So how do you work those things out? Life became very complicated in the midst of that. Uh, how do you work out decisions when the tax man, the government, decides you owe them money and you disagree? And all the advice that you're getting is, just pay it because you're never going to win an appeal on all of those issues. So I'll tell maybe at the end, if we have time, some of the outcomes of some of those stories and some of the dilemmas, just to simply say God did some amazing things in the process. Uh, I often say that that process was good for my faith, but bad for my heart, you know, in the sense that uh, there were moments I would wake up wondering where to from now or what's the next step trying to figure out where God may be leading. As the principal of IBI, a fair bit of that responsibility sat with me to try and figure out where do we go from here. That's not easy. Those are difficult choices and decisions. So with that said, I'd like to press in and think about one of the places that helped me in that process was looking at Paul as he worked through some decision making in the book of Philippians. Okay, so as we begin to think about Paul in decision making in Philippians chapter 1 and 2, what I'd like you to do, if you have your Bible, it'd be great if you took a moment. Um, I won't read all of them. I'll assume to a large extent you're reasonably familiar with Philippians chapters 1 and 2. But I just want to point out a couple of things along the way. Because I would argue that one of the first questions that Paul asks in seeking to make a decision is, is it good for the gospel? Okay, so for example, from verse uh, 12 to verse 18, Paul finds himself in prison. It's obviously that the Christians in Philippi are concerned. Okay, they are wondering 
how on earth is God allowing this to happen? After all, Paul is supposed to be an apostle, a sent one, and he finds himself in chains. There's something ironic about that process, okay? And Paul, in these few verses, writes to tell them that it's okay. The context in where he finds himself, and it's kind of decision-making in retrospect. He's trying to evaluate the situation. And what he's saying is, it's okay because it's good for the gospel. So, for example, verse 12. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result of what happened to me, people all over, the uh, household guard and in Philippi and other places have come to the realization that there is more to this gospel than they had before. So one of the big questions Paul's asked, is this good for the gospel? And I think it becomes a significant question when we are trying to figure out what choices should we make, how do we go forward? Uh, I think it helps us to divide a lot of the big issues up. Now it comes up in other ways. For example, one of the questions I ask when we have little control over the situation. And that's always a struggle. We found that at IBI, we felt that everyone else was in control except us, whether it was the bank, whether it was the revenue commissioners. We kind of felt we're just a pawn in this process and we felt powerless. And it's very easy to think Paul felt the same. In prison, in chains, what decision could he make? Was all decisions taken away from him? To some extent, yes. And sometimes society and the world and even some of our friends act in certain ways that take decisions out of our hands, except for one significant decision. And that is we have always got control over the decision as to how we will respond. That never leaves us. No matter how bad the situation is or how difficult it may appear, and so it was for Paul. He found himself in prison at the complete control of other people, but he paused long enough to say, I can decide what I think about this situation. I can decide how I view that God is at work in the midst of this, which is one of the things that the Romans or the Jews or all the others who over time sought to persecute him and uh, lock him away and such, such things could never take away from him. And Christians all over the world face that even today. Uh, they become persecuted. But the way in which they respond to that is something that is quite significant and important. Uh, so I would encourage you to think, if you find yourself in a situation where you feel you have no control, that you are not the one who is in control of a given situation, pause long enough to think that that's not true. Your response is always in your hands. Okay? The second question which sought to ask, what do you do when the outcomes are unclear? Uh, for us at IBI, the future, the next couple of years, we weren't sure where we were going. We weren't sure if a number of the steps and the plans and the decisions we were going to take were going to work out. So the great danger in that moment is you just become paralyzed and you make no choice, you make no decision. You let the world that you live in at that moment, the situation control you. One of the things I think is important, and we see it in Paul, is that, I'll come back to that, is that sometimes when the situation is unclear, just making the right decision isn't gonna solve everything. It's interesting in this passage that Paul finds himself in. Look what he says near the end of it. Verse 15, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here in the defense of the gospel. Verse 17, but the former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether by false motive or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Paul deciding that in the situation that it was good for the gospel, what was happening, didn't make the mess go away. 
He still had to live in it. There were still people who were preaching Christ, trying to get him in more trouble. And he chose to say, that doesn't matter. I think one thing that's very important for us to appreciate that the only thing God holds us responsible for is not the results of our decisions, but it is that our decisions or our influence moving things or pulling things in the right direction. That is what God holds us responsible for, not the outcome of them. So I may make a right choice, and somebody else may choose against that, and you know things turn horribly wrong. But God will not hold me responsible for someone else's choices. Okay. One of the things, though, that can help in this process is called the Jahari window. It's a process of helping to make better decisions, okay? So this may be uh, useful information-wise. It's really a pane, a, a window that has four panes in it, okay? And they're wrapped up in terms of knowing self, or known by self, and unknown by self. So what do I know about myself? What do I not know? So this here, it's an open area. If it's known by others and me, then that's out in the open. Everyone sees it. We're aware of it. But it becomes blind if it's unknown by me. That's one of the difficulties. And you may think you have no blind spots, but that's the reason they're called blind spots. Because you can't see them. You're unaware of them. Others may see them in some way or other, but you don't. Hidden areas, stuff you know, um, but you don't share with others. It's hidden from others. Some of that may be bad stuff, some of that may be good stuff. It's rightfully that you don't share everything with everyone. But hopefully there are some people in your life, close friends, spouses, whatever it may be, colleagues in ministry who you share more with. And there's less hidden in the midst of that. And finally over here, the fourth pain is the areas that are not known by, by you or by other people. They're still hidden. They may cause you to behave in a particular way, to make decisions in a particular direction, but you actually aren't quite fully sure as to why you're making those decisions. What is it that's driving you? Maybe things about your concept of God, things about you learned growing up in your family, things about your kind of country's history that impact you. All three of those is things I've learned along the journey uh, that were unknown areas and have become more known to me. But there's still lots to go there. Now, worst case scenario, your window pane looks a bit like this. There's a very small open area and a very large unknown area, right? So there's, there's a whole lot out there. You're making decisions, you're moving in directions and you don't know why you're doing it or whatever is driving you in that process. Okay? Here should be perhaps what we're working towards, the opposite, okay? A larger open area and a smaller of the other three, okay? Particularly the unknown area. How do you go there? Well, a couple of things that help significantly. First is feedback, okay? Uh, I was thinking maybe that arrow should point in the other direction. But, for example, do you take the time to talk to your friends, to ask them, do they see things in your life that you don't see? Or does that scare the life out of you? You know, to, to have a conversation with someone about, this is how I see myself, do you? Or to ask them, what would you believe to be my spiritual giftings and my temperament? What do you think I'm really good at? And what do you feel I make you know, a bags of or a hames of or I'm not very good at on day-to-day -day ministry. Uh, for some of us, that's very scary territory to move into, okay? But actually very important territory. So we gain feedback from other people. So what's known by others but not known by us is an area we should continually work in, particularly as Christians, particularly with Christian family and Christian colleagues and marriage, all of those they should be places we can work that stuff out. Another aspect is self-disclosure. You know, do you tell more people, safe people, about more about yourself so they know how to interact with you better and can help you in good decision-making? If you're doing both of those, there's a part of self-discovery that's going on. 
You're working through something and all of a sudden you become very aware. Wow, that's why I behave like that. I never knew that before. Or that's what I believe about God. And I never fully comprehended that before. Okay? Now this works personally, but it also works in a given situation. So let me explain going back to the illustration of IBI, the Irish Bible Institute, as we work through our building problem, for example. Okay? Uh, there was a while we looked a bit like this. Okay? Uh, uh, there was a whole lot of unknown area. Stuff I had no clue about. Okay? And the team who were, you know, we were theological educators and that kind of thing. What on earth do we know about property? Etc. Etc. Okay? The goal was to try and move to here. Well, blind areas, thankfully, one of the guys on our board uh, is the chief financial officer of one of the largest European banks and of its operation in Ireland. So we sat down with him and we had a long conversation with Kevin about what could happen here. We talked to the Christian individual who was involved in the property deal. And both of those said, you know, there may be a possibility that the bank might be willing to sell this building to IBI because we were kind of resident in it and it was going to cost them a lot to get us out. So we, they both said, you're in a good position. Sat with Kevin, he wrote this letter to the bank explaining our situation, best words he could, and then he did something that fascinated me. This guy is the chief financial officer of a major bank, and he said, you know, this is not my area of, experti of expertise. He said, but I have a friend who's in one of the other banks, another Christian who, he works in this area every day. He works with loans that are under, you know, undervalued or properties that are in difficult situations. Let me run this letter through him. He may have another opinion. See, Kevin saw that he had blind areas too, even though he worked in the industry. And he tried to push this barrier back even further. In October 2011 and after that, we worked very hard to push this boundary back. For example, I was feeling pretty bad about this whole situation. I had to somewhere led IBI into this situation. Now it had all gone bad. The great danger is I say nothing, but I begin to make decisions based on my pride, based on my vulnerability in this situation, etc., etc. So as a staff team, we began to talk a lot about how we felt, how this situation, which looked like it could be the end of something we had given 10 years of our life to, uh, how that impacted us and the implications it had for us. During that process, we engaged in self-discovery and we began to push out those areas. So even if things are unclear in a situation or in your own life, it's well worth your while to try and figure out how can I enhance that and how can I make things more clear by pushing back the boundaries a little ways. Next step. The next thing Paul decides in terms of his decision making is to ask the question, is it good for the church? If you take a moment and look at uh, verse 21. Paul says this, Philippians chapter 1, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Verse 22, Am I to go on living in this body, which will mean fruitful labor for me? Yet what should I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. Now look what he says, I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far. But this, but it is more necessary for you, Philippians, that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know I will remain. I suppose decisions don't get much bigger than this. This is life and death. Will I live? Will I die? And how does Paul decide? Well, he looks to the heart of God, and he says, God's concern is for the church. So I'm convinced that God would have me stay alive in this world. Fruitful labor. I desire to depart and to be with God. I'm not sure whether that's because Paul was in chains in prison. Maybe to desire to depart would be like God in that context is a little bit easier than for most of us to work out. 
But I suspect even for the Apostle Paul, if he was in a palace, he would probably say the same thing. But he knew different. As he decided to, to figure which, how do I decide? Is it best to live or die? His decision is, I choose, I believe that I should live because it's best for the church, for you Philippians, that I stay. So is it good for the church? Is a significant question to ask as we seek to make decisions. Okay, how does that work itself out? Well, for Paul, when, life, when decisions are life-changing, what do you do? How do you work that out? Well, I think the first thing to say about this is most decisions aren't. Most decisions are not about life and death. Most decisions are reversible. I talk to students at IBI who kind of the halfway through the year, a year that's eight months long, and they think the whole world has fallen apart because they're no longer sure if they should be here. Maybe they made the wrong decision. And I'm thinking, it's only eight months. It's only another four. So you can leave now and say, well, okay, I wasted the last four months. Or you can decide I'm going to stay to the end and get a certificate and see how that goes and see if God will lead me. It is not the end of the world. This decision is probably not life-changing. Now, there are a few. Decisions like marriage, decisions like accepting Jesus or rejecting Jesus, you know, those become lifelong. Having children or not having children, if that is a choice we're able to make. Those are significant choices. But it's important, I think, to appreciate that not all decisions carry the same weight. You know, I'm coming over here, and because we're doing a thing at the expo tomorrow, I had to get a bigger suitcase, right? And here I was thinking, should I try here and look here and look there and drive around a bit to see if I can get a cheap, cheaper suitcase? And uh, I'm thinking, you know, I might save five euro. It's going to cost me 10 in petrol to drive around, you know, and two hours to do it. And I'm thinking, just buy the suitcase. It doesn't really matter, you know? And there's a lot of decisions like that, that we shouldn't fret over, because in fact, they don't have any long-term consequence. The key is to identify the ones that will. You know, the choices we make that are dividing us from one path to another, okay? And I think things like, you know, perhaps some ministry decisions, but even those we may change at a later date, and that's okay. But certainly the ones I mentioned earlier, like marriage and uh, response to Christ. So some of those we need to be careful as we're talking to people, we're not diminishing them. But other ones I think we need to say, it may not be that big of a decision. I remember when I first came to faith, I had a real sense that God was calling me to go to Bible college. And that was why I ended up in Canada. And I struggled for a long time. There was about four or five places I was trying to figure out. I'd never been down. I had no choice to get. I had a lot of information I couldn't gather. And here I was fretting, praying, and God wasn't writing anything on the wall. So it was a little bit difficult, you know. And a mature Christian came beside me and said, Jacob, just choose. God is less concerned about where you go than he is about what you do when you get there. You know, and he said, when you get there, find believers who are passionate about Jesus and stick close to them. You know, and that is so true. Those decisions, you know, some of them in that sense are less important. And the second question, I think, give attention equal to the significance of the decision. I suppose that's what I'm trying to say there. Some decisions don't need a lot of time and energy. Others need more prayer, more advice, and such things. I'll talk about that in a minute. How do we discern God's opinion on our decision making? Well, the first thing I want to say is that God always has an opinion. Okay? And uh, that may be uh, mixed to a certain, in certain ways, but... God always has an opinion. When we ent entered into this situation with our building, one of the big questions was, you know, we were completely surprised. Uh, this hadn't to, was not going to be what we had, this was not what we had planned, not what we had hoped for. 
and we were a bit shocked. In fact, we were a bit shell-shocked, if I'm honest. But the one thing that God reminded us of was that he was not surprised. You know, uh, the whole Irish economy was surprised, and everything fell apart in Ireland, yet God wasn't surprised by that process. He was very much aware that these things were going to happen. So that process that God has an opinion is quite important, and that he's not surprised by that. Uh, And in some sense, this is connected to the process of finding the will of God, which is at times as elusive as uh, what, you know, the emotions that we're going through in any particular day. But I want to talk about that just a little bit, because it is connected to this issue of discerning what God's opinion or God's will is in the midst of our decision making. I want to use the acrostic of will and say the first thing that's quite important is that we're willing to do it. Are you willing to do God's will? If you knew what it was, would you be willing to do it regardless of the consequences? If any of you have been connected to the bracelets and stuff, was it WWJD, what would Jesus do? That kind of stuff. The original book written in his steps was built on that premise. If I come to an understanding of what God's will is, will I act upon it regardless of the consequences? See, sometimes I think that we want to know God's will so we could evaluate it. You know? Yeah, if you tell me what your will is, I'll think about that. You know? I'll get back to you on Monday. You know, it's like a job interview almost. I sometimes think, you know, often the process is a bit like this. You know, we, we work through God's will for our lives and we write it all out and we kind of come to God and say, will you sign off on the bottom of that? It's okay, isn't it? I think sometimes God turns the sheet around and says, if you sign on the bottom, we'll fill it in as we go along. You know? That's pretty scary. You know, that, that is pretty scary. But are you willing to do it? That is significant. Uh, and I think this is connected very significantly with our view of God. Again, talking to students at IBI, sometimes they come to me and ask questions like, what's God's will for my life? And I say, well, thankfully, that's not my job to figure out. <laughs> that's your job to figure out. Um, but I like to ask them some questions. And actually, one of the early questions I asked them is, what do you like to do? And they look at me as if I've got two heads. The assumption in their minds is that whatever God's will for my life is, it can't be remotely connected to what I like to do. It goes something like this. Uh, I'm afraid to surrender fully to God because I hate creepy crawly things. And if I fully surrender to God, I just know he's going to send me to Africa where there's lots of creepy crawly things. Right? Now, how does that connect to the biblical image of a loving heavenly father who's willing to give his son that we might not perish and have a relationship with him forever? See, that doesn't compute. Those two things don't match up. And that's some of the reason we're afraid to be willing to do because we have somehow lost the concept of how committed God is to us as individuals. Now, God may end up sending that person to Africa, but it won't be out of spite just because they hate creepy crawly things. God may have bigger things in mind for them beyond that. Okay, so the sense of not to be afraid, to be willing to do God's will is an important one. The second one is to gain insight from the Word of God, from the Spirit of God who dwells within us, from other believers to interact. Um, I like Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. It's a story of the Christians in Antioch. And it said, they prayed and fasted, and it seemed good to them to set aside Paul and Barnabas for mission. You see, the corporateness of Christianity at work Uh, I suggest that most of us should not make significant decisions in our lives on our own. We should do it together with God's people in some way or other. Be willing to draw in other people, to talk with them, to interact with them. The first L is to live as if you're in God's will. I suggest very often to individuals that unless there is known there is 
no serious known sin in their lives. They can assume they're in God's will where they are right now. Does that make sense? That's a big, that's a big statement. But I find very, very often we spend our entire lives looking for God's future at some point in the future, and we never live it in the moment. And I would suggest that unless there is serious sin in your life that the Holy Spirit has been placing his finger upon for a long time, that you shouldn't assume you're not in God's will where you are right now. That doesn't mean six months from now or a year from now or ten years from now you'll be in the same place. But live where you are and let God work through that. And let God lead you towards his full and perfect will. And he chooses to do that. As we live where we are and serve him and serve his people, then the process of God leading us on and changing our lives become quite significant and quite important in our lives. I would say to us that, let me use the lesser dramatic figures, something I say 95, but let me today say 90% of God's will for our lives is right here. But how we should live, that we should be holy lives, we should seek after the heart of God, we should make disciples. I could go on and on talking about the things that God says about our lives right here, that is his will for our lives. There's 10% of his specific will for your life or for my life that isn't listed here. You know? I sometimes think we spend 90% of our time worrying about the 10% and only 10% of our energy applying the 90% that we've already been given. And I think we, I say this to students at IBI, and I'm actually not sure if this is even biblical, but let me say it anyway, because I believe it is connected to what God has to say to us. I am convinced of this, that as you or me fully commit ourselves to God's revealed will for us, that we will stumble upon his perfect, you know, specific will for our lives. Or more biblically, he will lead us to it very clearly. So concentrate on the stuff we know and trust God with the stuff it's more difficult to figure out. And he leads us in those directions. I know that's not always possible. We may be facing very difficult decisions that we have to make choices on. And there's no verse in scripture that's going to guide us directly to them, to an answer there. But generally the question of how we live and how we trust God and are we seeking to walk after him are the primary issues in terms of the situation of making decisions when we don't have all the information that we need. The last step. The last question I think Paul asks in a sense is, is it good for others? Philippians chapter 2, the classic passage about Jesus, where he says in verse 4, and each of you should not look only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, having all this power, being equal with the very nature of God, did not hold on to it, did not grasp it, but let it go. In a sense, what he did was he used his great power for our well-being. And that is one of the great challenges that we see in Christ. If you're in a position of power, if you have a possibility of making a decision, is one of the things that's part of that decision, the well-being of others. Is it good for others? Okay? I think for some people in Christian ministry, that's pretty scary. Uh, at IBI, I teach on servant leadership. And I can just see in people's faces the fear. You know, I'll become a doormat. Everyone's going to walk over me, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that's how it works out. I do say to folk, you know, we are called to be servants to all, but we only have one master. And he's the one who guides us as to where we should serve and how we should serve. So there's a couple of things that are important here. 
How do we survive? Always deciding for the welfare of others? I think that's a critical question. I think that's a question that we all feel from time to time, but sometimes we're afraid to voice it. Okay? And so how do I survive? What about me? Who looks after me? In the midst of me looking after everyone else. I don't know if you've ever felt that way, but I think it is an important one. The first part of that is identity in Christ. John chapter 13, verse 3. John chapter 13 is where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. You know, this classic image of servant leadership. Do you know what John, you know what verse 3 says? It says, And Jesus, knowing from where he had come and to whom he was returning, stripped off his clothes, wrapped a towel around his waist, and washed his disciples' feet. You see, he knew who his father was. He knew from where he had come, heaven. He knew to whom he was returning. And that gave him the capacity to serve others. If we serve others based on a lack that is within us, we're trying to somehow fill up something we feel lacking in us, that's disastrous for us and for them, actually. Because if we do that and they don't behave as we want, we tend to attack them in some way or other, or get angry with them and everything else. But I sometimes say uh, the question of true servanthood and serving others can only flow out of adequacy in me or you as an individual. It can never flow out of inadequacy. If I feel inadequate in the sense of lacking in my relationship with God, if I don't have a strong sense of who I am in Jesus, then it's very difficult for me to serve others well. And that's what I mean by identity in Christ. But if I am very comfortable that Christ has given his life for me, that the Father is on my side, and he seeks to care for me and look after me, then I have much greater capacity to minister to others without expectation of how they behave or don't behave. Okay, so I think that process is important. Um, and the second one we'll talk about, it's connected. How should I consider my interests in areas such as education, professional welfare, for my own welfare, those kind of things? How do I think about those when I'm told I should be concerned about others? Well, I don't think the two are completely opposed to one another. I would simply say, go back and ask the three questions again. It's interesting. Being here, you, in, you interact with people who are at the top of their kind of game in terms of their profession or their ministry, their training. They've done a lot of education or whatever it may be. And in that process, that's what enables them to serve Christ well and to serve his kingdom. So is it good for the church? that I might go and get more education? Is it good for the gospel? Is it good for others? Indeed, it may be. If I'm thinking about, a ch say I'm pastoring a church or leading a ministry team, I would suggest that it's good for them, the church or the ministry team or the ministry that I'm involved in, that I actually take good time off and relax, spend time alone with God, all of those things that probably nobody else sees, I may even wonder what I'm up to, that's actually good for them. So they're not opposed to one another. If we understand them correctly, then to go off on holidays for a couple of weeks is actually a good thing because we come back refreshed and able to serve again. The alternative to that is that we burn out in ministry and we become angry and bitter. A friend of mine says, when the needy old lady in the congregation becomes the cantankerous old hag, you know you need a break. You know, he said, that's about me, it's not about them. You know, and I think that often happens that way. We, we, we feel people are getting at us, and in fact, we haven't actually been looking after our own interests, our own welfare. I think it's no surprise that we're told to love others as we love ourselves. And those two issues are inter interconnected with one another. Okay? So 
going back to where I started, the original story of uh, being involved in IBI and seeing the things that God did there, we began a journey to walk with God with a significant lack of information at times. Uh, sometimes we acted in ways against advice. The revenue, as I said, they, they believed we owed them 150000 In fact, we got bill for it and had to pay. And we paid a huge amount of money to an expert, 400 euros an hour, for him to tell us it's not worth appealing, nobody ever wins. You know, that's what experts get paid for, consultants. Uh, we felt um, internally obligated to say, no, we actually need to do something here. We felt honor bound to at least appeal. We did. And amazingly, we won. Uh, yeah, it was quite incredible, the process, and it was quite convoluted. Uh, in fact, the reason we won was because we lost. Let me explain that to you. Um, does, in Ireland, there's a distinction between what we call a long lease and a short lease. In a short lease, which we believed we had, less than 10 years, uh, you pay the tax every year. On a long lease, more than 10 years, you have to pay all the tax in the first year. Okay, we thought we had a short lease, revenue ruled that we had a long lease and all the money should have been paid in the first year. In fact, the amount was 450,000 plus penalties, plus interest, which amounted to somewhere, the f first calculation they did was 800,000. I'm thinking we're just closing up and going home, turn the lights out when we leave. That was how we felt at that moment. We worked through a lot of that stuff. It was much to do with our landlords, nothing really to do with us, except we had to pay the bill because the lease said we were responsible for tax implications. Uh, we appealed. And in fact, what, we, what had happened was we had settled with the revenue in the first five years and they agreed with us for the first five years that we had paid the bill and we were settled. And we had a letter from them saying they were not gonna revisit the first five years. But then they came along and said, in fact, this is a long lease, we're gonna revisit all of it. So we appealed on that basis. The internal external committee that we appeal to, some people in revenue, some people experts from outside of revenue, actually agreed with the revenue commissioners that we had a long lease. But then they turned around and said, but since it's a long lease and all the money was due in year one, and you've already written to the Irish Bible Institute saying to them, you are not going to revisit the first five years. You can't actually collect that money. Please give it back to them and they give us back 150,000. What was particularly unique about that was when we were negotiating with the bank to try and get a really good deal on buying the building, we finally agreed in the region of 25% uh, of the original cost, so 25 cent on the euro. Uh, that 150,000 was not in our bank account. It was actually sitting in the revenue bank account. And so when we went to the bank, and disclosed all our assets, that money was elsewhere. So that's how strange God works in some unique and amazing ways. And we sought to be as honorable as we could through that process, but it was fascinating. And in eight months, again, some days I still don't understand the process, but we felt we should go ahead. The decision we made was to go ahead and to... Uh, try and buy the building. The bank said, well, that's okay, we can do that, but you have to raise the money in six months. And it was a million euro. Uh, this was the worst recession Ireland had ever faced. And yet, we saw God do amazing things to bring us to that point where all of that worked out. Okay? So in closing, I would say this. It's also worth, as you're considering your own interests, to consider the negation or the opposite of the three questions. For example, let's say in one of the afternoon sessions you decide, could have been this one, maybe some in the next couple of days, I think I'm just gonna go for a walk or I'm gonna stay in bed or wherever it may be. Should you do that? Well, let me sit, we shouldn't record it. No, it's recording, anyway, but I'll put my, they won't invite me back, <laughs> okay? But let me say this, is it, good for, is it bad for the gospel? Probably not, if you don't turn up at one session. Is it bad for the church? Probably not, if you don't turn up at one session. 
Is it bad for others? I probably wouldn't have missed you. You know what I mean? I know it breaks your heart, but that's, you know. So sometimes the negation of them, and if it's not bad for the gospel, if it's not bad for the church, if it's not bad for others, then perhaps Augustine had it right when he said, love God and do as you please. You know, I suggest these three questions are connected with the loving God and loving the things he loves.